Hello, everybody. Today I am sitting with Morley Robbins. Hello, Morley. Amy, how are you? It's great to be here. Yes, so excited to have you. So today we're going to see Morley in slightly a slightly different light. Uh, normally he's educating and sharing his scientific knowledge about all the literature that he reads daily. But today I thought Morley's going to come to us not so much in a professional sense. So Morley, you're going to share today a little bit about your personal experience with the RCP. Uh, not what you've not what you've learned, not what you know, so much as what you've actually experienced for yourself throughout the time you've devoted to, I guess, improving your own health. Um, so we're really going to focus today on on your health and your implementation of of the protocol. How does that sound, Molly? No, I think it's a great great area of focus, and I'm sure people are very curious about it. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think so. It's important. I Go ahead. No, go ahead. I was just going to say, I'm I'm certainly curious as as to what you've been doing, particularly over my time following you in the last sort of ten, well, a little bit less than ten years. Um, I, I definitely think there's something anti aging going on with you. <laughs> At least I recall you looking uh, a little bit older when I first met you. <laughs> so I'm not sure I, you know, I'd say I, you're I a pretty. Pretty decent poster child for for the way of life that you you know we're all promoting in in our community. So you must be doing something right. So why don't you just take us on a on a little journey, I guess, through you know through your health. What did what did that look like, and what does it look like now? Okay, no, that's great. So I think um, a little context. I was, and I think some people know kind of the, the broad uh, parameters, but I just make sure people understand that. Um, I got lousy genes. <laughs> people, people are focusing on the genetic side. Um, you know, I was born into a very sickly family. A lot of, a lot of illnesses. A lot of trips to hospitals as a, uh, a visitor. Um, my, my grandmother, my mother's mother, was always in the hospital. If, if it wasn't kidney disease, it was heart attacks. It was, I, it was cataract surgery. I mean, she was, she was a lovely individual. Brilliant. She was a gifted artist, and uh, she was a poet, musician, gardener. I mean, she was a, a very talented woman, but she was also very sick and produced three very sick children, um, one of them being my mom. Of course, the middle child. So my mom, so it was Aunt Betty, my mom, and then Aunt Lee. And uh, Aunt Betty was an alcoholic. Okay, she died of, of uh, cirrhosis of the liver and cancer. And Aunt Lee, um, she actually did okay, but she had severe kidney disease. And um, their, uh, Aunt Betty's uh, two daughters were both dead before they were 50. So again, we're, we're talking about some pretty serious uh, illness in the family. <clears throat> my, my, uh, my mom, <laughs> God love her, she was, she was a good cook, but she was also in the hospital a lot. Uh, she was a very heavy drinker, smoker, proud of the fact that she started smoking when she was 12. Uh, I mean, just like, oh my gosh, <laughs> is, that, is that a source of pride? And um, I was always hiding cigarettes all over the house and trying to find her, her liquor bottles and hiding them. And <laughs> it, was a, it was a kind of a game, I suppose. And my, my dad was a very sickly guy. He was, um, he was born literally with a silver spoon in his mouth. Uh, and everything was fine until he was 17. And then the, the stock market collapsed in 32. They made it through the 29 crash, but 32 crash, they lost everything. And uh, he was never the same after that. And uh, he had a manic depression and schizophrenia. And I mean, it's just like, okay. So I, I don't want people to think that I, I have this storybook uh, background. And my sister, older sister, she was... Um, God love her. She was she was a nurse, um, not just in her training, but that was just who she was. She was a very nursely type. Uh, I think the only argument that Paige and I ever had was uh, after we had seen the um, the movie with Jack Nicholson, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, and I accused her of being Nurse Ratchet. 
<laughs> that went down like a bag of cement. <laughs> she was not happy. And, uh, but she was a good sport. We eventually uh, kissed and made up. But um, she passed away just recently, uh, this past uh, Thanksgiving here in the States. Um, I was supposed to see her the Sunday after Thanksgiving, and I had this nudge. Uh, Dr. Liz and I were driving up through Baltimore. I said, I think we need to go see Paige mm -hmm. this Sunday before Thanksgiving. And thank, thank heavens we did. Um, but she died of a massive heart attack. And so it's just, you know, um, out of that, coupled with the fact that um, I, I had a pretty stressful lifestyle, you know? <laughs> I mean, I think there's the stress expresses many different ways, but um, I think what really was the start of this whole process of recovery was discovering the work of, um, well, there's a company here in the States called Nightingale Conant, and they do a lot of um, motivational tapes for salespeople. And it's based upon the concept of we are what we think about. Mm. And, and change your thinking, change your mind, and you'll change your life. And I just, I started to do that big time uh, in my 30s. Um, I spent a lot of time with those motivational tapes. Uh, a lot of work with um, oh, uh, Tony Robbins and yeah. uh, Wayne Dyer and Marion Williamson, you know, that whole lineage of people who are so steeped in inspiring people. And it really helped free me up from this idea that we have this destined path. No, we, we really do have free will. And uh, we just have to decide what it is. And back then I had no inkling of of what this was all about. Um, in my, I guess I was 31. I was living in um, the Chicago, north of the Chicago area. And I wanted to buy a, a health food store. I was just, I was fascinated with nutrition and I, I was just drawn to it. I, I volunteered there. Uh, and the, the owner wanted to pay me. I said, no, no, no I'm doing this for, just for my, my benefit. And help you. I'm happy to help you out. And and I talked to a um, a buddy of mine from college, and I told him I really wanted to buy this health food store. And at the time, uh, Matt, my oldest son, was was on the scene, and and Rick said, "Are you crazy? You can't raise a family running a health food store." I went, "Really?" <laughs> so I I, ba I abandoned that idea, and I, I've often thought. What, what would have happened if I had pursued that low those many years ago? It would have been 25 years before I even, even had an inkling of what magnesium was. So it's very interesting to think about what I was drawn to. And I think what people also need to know is that I'm not a chef. In fact, I'm the antithesis of a chef. I'm, I love to eat. I really do enjoy eating. But I asked me to, to put on an apron and whip together some food. Like, no. <laughs> and Dr. Liz has three sons who are very gifted at, at cooking and chefs of their own right. And I remember talking to one of her sons about my aversion to cooking. He said, well, what's the, what's the problem? I said, well, I'm afraid of making a mistake. He goes, you can never make a mistake in a kitchen. <laughs> he said, you just improvise. So I just want people to know that, that I'm, I'm a really lousy cook. Uh, I come from a really lousy set of genes. But for the grace of God, I, I just decided that I can, I can make it work. And um, I, I, I knew there was more to the story. I just had this uh, intuitive sense that even though everyone in my family that, and again, I, I take you after the Matthews family. That's my middle name, Matthews. And every one of the Matthews family dies of a heart attack. You know, my mom died of her third. Her mom died of her third. Her dad died of his second, and his dad died of his first. Wow. And so it's just, so it's just that's that's how I'm going to go, folks. When you boom, and that's how my sister went. She went of a massive heart attack. So I I know what I know how it's going to end. I just don't know when, and I'm not going to try to push it off as far as I can. But um, I knew that the the party line about heart disease was not true. I. I was drawn to question the cholesterol narrative. 
Uh, and this was long before uh, mm -hmm. the MAG group existed. And so I just was very, I'm, I'm a contrarian. I think people have <laughs> figured that out by now. So I'm, I'm, I'm very quick to challenge the uh, status quo. And I, I do the research. And so I have this vivid memory of meeting with my um, internist who I'd gone to for 25 years. We, we, you know, Tom and I had, had a very close relationship. He'd helped me weather some minor problems uh, with a, a boil on my arm and you know, just little things that were pesky things. And um, my cholesterol was always between like 185 and 195. And then one time it was 201. <laughs> and I had this, I had this very meticulous spreadsheet where I was keeping track of everything. So I was on top of all my heart information and my cholesterol went up to 201. And Tom said, well, I got to put you on a statin. I went, what? <laughs> I mean, that was the you only time we ever had. You ticked over that one too many. And that's, that's one, the line, right? It was a line. Yep. I, I went over and, um, it's the only time we ever had harsh words for each other. And he slammed my, my folder shut and said, well, we'll talk about it later. And I said, yeah, well, much later. I never went back to him. <laughs> but um, I don't know. I just, I just knew something was going on. And, and throughout all of this, just so people have this better sense of who is Morley, uh, I always had sinus infections. <laughs> And, and try having sinus infections and flying on airplanes. It's miserable. Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember coming back from a trip and I had this piercing sinus infection, but I had this pain in my, in my ear. It was so sharp. I couldn't believe it. And then and there was like this little mini explosion and, and blood came out. And I was like, what's going on? And so, you know, I had um, I had no idea that, that copper was missing. It was MIA in my head, but um, it, it was that fateful encounter with Dr. Liz to, to clear up my frozen shoulder that introduced me to there is a, a whole other paradigm, the, 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 the natural natural healing, which was fascinating to me, and I think with all of this coming out of a sea of, of illness and, and this curiosity and this belief that there was more to the story. It just, it seemed like it was, I was destined to, to try to come up with some answer. And of course, in the beginning, it was magnesium, magnesium, magnesium. And, uh, it, and I remember this one practitioner said, Morley, if it were that easy, we would have figured it out. We'll be doing it. <laughs> yeah. and, and in my naive arrogance, I thought, well, you don't understand it the way I do. And of course, he was right and I was wrong. So um, again, it, it was that fateful reading of uh, Ray Pete's article on iron toxicity. And he talked about, to my knowledge, no one's ever developed a menu or, or a recipe for increasing ceruloplasma. Well, I was, I was absolutely smitten by that statement. And, and challenge was, accepted. <laughs> yeah, challenge accepted. And, and I just said, I, I want to I want to take this on, and when I when I was talking about this idea with my my son uh, Matt, he said, "Well, I think what you need to do, Dad, is have things you've got to do and things you shouldn't do." And the, he was the, he originated this idea of stops and starts. It would never have occurred to me to talk about stops, but uh, the engineer in him said, "I think you got to talk about what you shouldn't do," and um, so then it then it became this fascination to say, "What what does it take?" And what does the research say it's going to take? And, and then it just it became this uh, almost lifestyle commitment to say, what, what can we do to increase ceruloplasma, increase bioavailable copper? And, and is that, you know, Molly, is that where your, uh, you know, your quest to just dive into the research, you know, going back 100 years, did it start then or were you already, you know, delving into that? that science before you discovered magnesium? For, for like 2010 to 2012, it was um, reading books and reading critical articles in large part around magnesium. But I think it was the last 10 years have been this um, almost um, 
no holds barred pursuit of what's the truth. I really want to want to understand the nuance. And like here's an, here's an example, and I hope folks appreciate this. Um, so there's a front door to letting copper into the cells. Very important. Got to have, and it's called CTR one, copper transporter one. And if CTR1 is not working right, you can't let copper in. And if you can't let copper in, then it can't get to the enzymes where they need it. Well, it turns out, and I was just reading this uh, yesterday, that if the, if the heart perceives that it doesn't have enough copper, it can shut down the absorption of copper in the intestine and the liver to divert whatever copper there is to our heart. You just stop and think about that. Think about the, 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 the communication, the signaling that's taking place. And, and when we talk about copper having intelligence, that's a sign of intelligence. But, but to have the ability to turn off the, the influx of copper into the liver and the intestine, where it's really important for it to come in and say, no, the ticker wants it. I mean, I was just, I was blown away when I read that. I was like, wow. I mean, it, on one level, it makes so much sense. But on another level, it's like, that's mind blowing. So that, is, that is mind blowing. And, and at the risk of delving into the science, which is not really what we're going to do today, I do have to ask one question. And that is, what or where in the heart is it that has this sensor or detects that lack of copper that sends that message Wouldn't we to all the other to... systems? No, I think that's a wonderful question. That, that is the question. The question I want to know is who's running the mitochondria? There's got to be some nerve center that says mitochondria are not happy or mitochondria seem okay. Or what? And of course, it's regionally distributed, you know, but it's like there's a central, there's a CPU. I know there is, and that's what you're alluding to is the CPU. And again, given the relationship between copper and mitochondria, it's, it's, it's all balled up in there. And they're sensing that they can't make enough energy. Come on, we need more copper. So it's just, it's, it's actually- The heart's where it's at. The heart is where it's at. <laughs> and, and then we have to deal with these nimrods who say everyone's copper toxic. It's like, oh my God. So. Uh, the, the whole idea, what, what, what this whole uh, milieu of, of experiences created this really curious cat who wanted to know why is everyone so sick and, and what can I do to not just help myself, but help other people. And, and then, of course, the, the question, the really question people want to know is, well, what do you do more of? You know? And so I, I've never smoked, never, never been... A, both my parents died of, of lung-related diseases. So I thought that would be pretty simple to lower my risk there. Yes. Don't, don't smoke. Uh, I've never even smoked a joint, folks. You know, I'm one of those weird goody two-shoes. I never did it. In my, in my fraternity, uh, before graduation, senior year, 18 guys tried to get me to smoke a joint. And I said, no, I won't do it. So, you know, I, just, I wasn't going to let the smoke in my lungs. So... Um, I'm, I'm not, a, I'm not a, a priest, but there's just certain things I won't do. I've never done drugs. You know, it just never, it never really appealed to me. I've had way too much alcohol in my day. Um, and, and not that I ever had the, the affliction that my mom had, but I really I said, I don't need that. So Dr. Liz and I don't drink. We made that decision, I guess, about seven years ago. Yeah. And um, so that, that cuts out a lot of static. A lot, of, a lot of sugar. So people are like, well, what does Mikey do? Well, that's, those are some things that Mikey does. Um, I, I try to be really careful about what we eat. You know, we have a very predictable breakfast. It's, it's eggs. It's gonna involve some kind of meat, usually bacon. It's gonna have some uh, mechanism to have butter on it. It's usually, it's, if it's not a pancake, it's gonna be bread or toast of some sort or something. Uh, Dr. Liz loves to turn a leftover potatoes or squash or something into pancakes. I don't, I don't know how she does it, but they're yummy. And, but it's just an excuse to have more butter. 
And um, so breakfast is pretty predictable. Um, before I get to breakfast, I, you know, I have uh, two cups of coffee, two big cups of coffee. And that's what, that's what uh, activates my sensors to, to find these articles and understand what the heck they're saying. Um, and, and what's, I'm sure people are going to wonder, what's in the coffee? Yeah, it used to be Starbucks, didn't it? No, it's not Starbucks anymore. No longer. No longer. It's, um, it's, it's coffee, um, community coffee from Louisiana. Um, Dr. Liz's daughter sends it up to us. Um, lots of butter. I mean, like a, a, an obscene amount of butter. Butter in um, your coffee? Butter in my coffee. Yeah. Gin, butter, ginger, a ginger. splash of, yeah, ginger, a splash of um, maple syrup and some cream. So that um, gets me started. And um, so I have that between like six and nine. And then we eat usually between 9.30 and 10 is breakfast. We don't, we don't eat a lunch. We don't have a midday meal. And then we have a, a dinner, usually somewhere between five and six, depending on what, what's going on uh, in the RCP world and you know, things like that. But, um, and that's pretty predictable too. It's gonna be some kind of meat. Dr. Liz is really of late, is enjoying making soups. So we we'll typically have a soup a salad, you know, some kind of green. Uh, beets are, are a favorite, um, but some kind of root vegetable uh, there. And then um, we, we do have a little bit of dessert. We'll either have chocolates or maybe a cookie if we're really feeling crazy. Um, but, the, but the goal is less calories. Mm -hmm. And that's based on the work. I can't think of the scientist's name. He was a... He studied uh, aging at UCLA, yeah. and he, he said it's not complicated. You need fewer calories. And as we get older, you don't need as much food. You really don't, because you're, you're not burning calories the way you do when you're younger. Like when, when we were five years old, we were just perpetual motion machines. Well, mm -hmm. you get older, you're not going to be moving quite that much. But you just don't burn calories the same. So why, why put them in on the front end? And, um, and usually when people are hungry, they're usually thirsty. So we'll, we'll tend to... Uh, go that direction. But the, 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 the protocol itself is just a very important part of supplementing what we eat. Again, the, the word supplement is, a, it's an active word uh, and it's meant to uh, add to what we've got. Um, I think had I not had access to especially magnesium and especially um, the copper liver chelate that um, standard process made for many, many years, and now, again, I'm, I'm using uh, the, the cuprate. Uh, I think I'd be lost without those two minerals. I think that would have, I'm sure that the magnesium would have uh, shortened my life, the lack of magnesium. And um, now understanding the nuance of, of just minerals in general and the retinol and the boron and all the other components, it's very, very important. But it's just the, 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 the critical role that those minerals and, and retinol play, I think are uh, legendary. And they, I think they've been instrumental in helping me stay, you know, stable. I have my moments, I get stressed out folks. I think you know that. Uh, the last two years were not easy years for anyone, mm -hmm. but especially for those of us in the RCP, because it, it just reinforced a lot of the insanity that, that we know is not right. And, when it first happened, I was convinced that was the end of the, of the program. I was like, there's no way that RCP can survive this. And what we're finding out, it's actually the springboard to our success. Absolutely, yeah. And that's, that's fine. You know, I don't, I don't think we're gonna change allopathic medicine. Uh, I don't think that's our purpose, but we're certainly changing a lot of lives and having fun doing it. Mm -hmm. And I think we're, we're showing that uh, the body can bounce back. You know, I, I hear uh, case study after case study of people who have been faced with a lot of adversity and they, they can't believe how they're able to weather the storm. Uh, again, people within the community still get sick. You know, Chris, yeah. Christiane, I mean, who's, who's more paragon of, of the RCP? Well, she got COVID somehow. She was down and out for maybe two or three days. She, she didn't feel right for a week. But she's 
No, she bounced back. And bounced she's back. Just, yeah, now yeah. she's back in the snow. And, and, and that's so, what it is, isn't it, Molly? It's that that ability to bounce back and exactly. um, and weather yeah. and metabolize that stress. And I know going back, you had a, a very stressful career before you uh, kind of turned the corner into the natural health world. Um, so a lot of stress then, and equally probably in a different way now, but a, a lot of stress now in a different way. What you what you do and what you put out is uh, would be very demanding on your body. So how's your ability to cope with that stress changed over time um, since you've had the, the support of good food and, and minerals? Well, you know, when, when I first started, I, I think I was uh, on a mission to, to slay the dragon. And um, I think I've learned that that's not going to happen. <laughs> and I was, I think early on, I was very quick to blame the doctors. Mm -hmm. And I think Ben Edwards, especially, and others, other physicians who said, you, you know, you can't blame us. You, know, you can chide us for our education, you can chide us for our curiosity, but you can't yeah. blame us for, for what the system is. And, yeah. and they're absolutely right. So I, I think I've, I've really relaxed a lot. I mean, anyone who's uh, read what I had to say in those early years of the MAG group and the early uh, iron toxicity posts that Teresa Bowie so graciously edited and took all the venom out of, um, I, I was a really, I was, I was angry. I was, I was upset with the system because, because again, I was going back to all of the, the heartache and the illness yeah. that I'd grown up with, and that's thinking you got to blame somebody, right? <laughs> and I've, I think what I've learned is like, there's no, there's no um, benefit in blame. It just is, and so I think I've, I've relaxed um, my expectations, and I think as the, as the group has grown, as the movement has has matured, if you will. I see a real sense of, of hope that we may not we may not change society, but we're going to change a portion of it. Yeah. And and that's that's a wonderful legacy to know that that we've helped a lot of people breathe easier, that we've helped bring resilience to families. I mean, I remember this one client who was uh, commenting about her situation, and she said, you know. Did, did I ever tell you that I was doing that? I was really focusing on her kids. She said, did I ever tell you I was doing it? I said, no. I said, is it helping you? She said, yes. We went into this cat and mouse thing. And I said, it's like, have you been keeping track of what has been helping? She said, yes. I said, like, how many things? And she said, well, it, it's 42 things. I said, oh, well, you were so close. If it had been 50, I would have been impressed. <laughs> and, and she said, but you have to understand. She said, it's not just in our family. He said, Marley, everyone in our cul-de-sac is doing the RCP. Yeah. You don't know, but you your protocol stopped a divorce from going forward. And it's just the ripple effect is just wildly entertaining to think about how this simple idea of helping people make more energy and and be be more resilient, as you say, and be able to respond to their stress. It's like, okay, that's what we're meant to be. That's what our that's what mother made. Mother Nature and our maker really wanted. They wanted us to be these resilient beings that were responding to stress because we're always going to have stress on this planet. Yes. It's never going to go away until we're six feet under. And we, we are not meant to be slaves to that stress. And so it's just, it's important to know that we have a game plan and a protocol that can help people really uh, weather that storm. Yeah. And I think too, you know, even if we're talking one or two percent of the population um you know that's a significant number of people in this generation and mm -hmm. hopefully yeah. it can filter down through families like you say i know myself i've got three uh young girls and they all have an understanding of uh, you know at, at, at a teenage and child level mm -hmm. but 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 they they get it you know and so i have no doubt that you know what i've learned through you is is going to kind of continue on um, down the generation. So you know, there's a lot more benefit to come than than where we are right now. I think it's um, it takes time, and and we are you know changing the landscape of people who are already there, but it's just tweaking it, isn't it? And it's that understanding of what nutrients, what minerals we actually need, as opposed to what nutrients and minerals the health world is currently telling us that we need. 
And I, I was having a conversation recently with a, he was a 35 year old guy and we we're talking about the protocol and, and he had a four year old son. And he was really pushing hard about, well, does the protocol deal with this? Does it deal with that? And I said, I said, hold on. I said, how old is your son? He said, well, he's four. I said, well, that's how old the protocol is. I said, it'll be five this year. So it's, it's five years old. I said, think about what it's going to be like when it's your age, when it's 35 years old. He went, good point. So again, we're, we're still in our infancy. I think people uh, lose sight of the fact that, that this idea really, it really emerged in, um, it was like 2016, 2017, was mm -hmm. it really began to take hold as the training started to, to come into being. We wanted to, to spread the word about what we knew and, and, and try to help more people with, with these concepts. But it's like, good heavens, we're, we're five years in. And, yeah. uh, and so it's just, it's fascinating to think about what the, what the possibilities will be in 30, 40, 50, 75 years. I mean, it's, it's going to evolve, it's going to mature, it's going to change. I, I guarantee it's gonna change. And I think um, one of my, my, my drives is what can we do to simplify it? Mm -hmm. And I just think it's important that uh, there's, a, there's a whole um, population out there that's willing to do what we recommend faithfully. And, it, and is it, I think it works well, can it work better? And that, that's the constant tension in the community is what can we do to improve it? And, and we're not trying to needlessly tinker with it, but we're just saying, what, what can we do to make it so that more people would be more willing to, to embrace it? Yeah, yeah. And, and I trust that in 35 or 40 years, you'll still be around to, uh, to be leading us. <laughs> well, well, we'll see about that. I'm not going to make it. No, I, was, I was talking with a physician the other day he actually, he called me up uh, recently and uh, he said, Morley, I'm re I really appreciate all your work and very impressed with it. He said, I understand iron. I didn't know what copper was, but now I do. And he said, how would you like to turn your RCP bike into a Tesla? And I went, we've got my attention. And uh, so we were talking just the other day, uh, we're, we're act Dr. Liz and I are gonna be going down uh, to his office in Miami in August, folks. It's, it's the time to go to Miami is in the dead of summer. And um, he was saying, well, I'm pretty confident I can, I can help you get to 120. I'm like, okay, we'll, we'll see. <laughs> yeah, wow, exciting times. Yeah, so we'll see. Yeah, so just to bring the focus back to you, I suppose, tell us about you know, what, what does your protocol look like? What does it look like for you? My protocol is, um, it really is around those minerals that I talked about, the minerals, the, the base minerals, uh, magnesium, the copper, very, very loyal to that. Vitamin C, absolutely essential. Um, the cod liver oil, um, and, and I go between the, the, the jigsaw and, and the rosetas. Uh, pretty faithfully. Um, the, the bee pollen, love, that's the first thing I eat every day is the bee mm. pollen. Um, I'm not as faithful on the DE. I probably should be more faithful, but I'm not. Uh, never really liked the taste of it. Yeah, it tastes like dirt, huh? It tastes like dirt. Nutritional yeast, uh, we, we found a really good support source. It's actually from... Um, we, we discovered it through our friends in um, Lancaster, PA, the Amish, uh, found a really good source in France. And uh, it, they don't modify the, the folate, the, the B9. And uh, really love that. That has a nice, nice uh, feel to it. Yeah. And, and um, what else? I, I mean, I'm pretty, pretty faithful to the protocol itself. But you know that there are days, folks, when I just like I don't want to take supplements, so I just don't. If if I'm not drawn to them, I don't take them. Yeah. And and I, I think it's important that as in I think in the early years I was much more religious about it because I was trying to make up for lost time, and it's, and I don't 
I mean to sound like it's, I've got it licked and everything's I can chill, but I some days I just don't, you know, it I might take supplements three or four days a week, maybe five days a week, but not seven days a week. And um, and I feel pretty good. I, I sleep well, knock on wood. Um, I always have, and that's that's always been my salvation. Um, I get angry, you know, if there's something really upsets me, I'll explode and I'll get it out of my system and, and then move on. But um, I try to try to keep my level head about me. And so, uh, especially over the last two years, but the, but the protocol, uh, I think it's, I think it's an invaluable part of our lives, but I don't always uh, use it every day. Yeah. And some people might find that shocking to hear, but um, I have to go with what feels right. And I know how important it is, how important it's been for me throughout the years, but but now it's just, for some reason it's like it isn't as um, central to my diet as it as it was mm. in the first three or four years of the of the protocol. So we'll see. I'm, I'm still a work in progress, if you will. And I and I really I like when um, Christian talks about the initial conversation with the client. So what's your version of the protocol? Because that's a really important question to find mm. out. What are you doing? We've got. 10 to 12 different things you should be doing. How many of the are you doing? Yeah. Well, I probably do, when I do it, I'm using probably about eight or nine yeah. uh, consistently. And I know dabble with some of the others, but um, you know, I, I have to go with my gut and what yeah. feels right. And um, again, the, my blood work is in pretty good shape. Mm. And my, my hair tests are in pretty good shape. And again, uh, you know, I've got a few years but it's just, um, I go by how I feel. I go by, do I feel rested? Do I feel energized? Am, am I able to um, solve the puzzles of the day? And there, there are some days when I'm like, oh, wow. And then I'll, I'll have like, we're, we took a trip uh, today uh, for, for a couple of days to meet with some colleagues out here in the Charlotte area. And I had to organize all my reading. And it was like in three different places. It took me an hour, but I was able to do it. It's like, you know, just brought it together. And I do that all the time. Uh, I think people would, they would pass out if they saw the uh, array of papers around our condo. I think they'd go, really? This is how you live? How do you keep track of it all? I do wonder. So oh, it's just, it's, it's, it's a sign of an organized mind is a cluttered desk, right? Oh, okay. Okay, yeah. so it's, 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 it's out there instead of in there, the clutter. Yeah. Okay, that makes sense to me, yeah. <laughs> so yeah. I, I guess, you know, on that, on uh, your own experience that you, you commenting that you, you need to feel drawn to certain supplements on certain days, I've yeah. heard you say numerous, numerous times, that, you know, this is, it's not a Julia Child's recipe to follow. Yeah. Although having yeah. said that, I'm certain that there are a lot of people, particularly at the start of their journey, that are very grateful for the handbook and the very oh. stepped out nature of the protocol. But right. can you speak a little bit more into using our intuition, I guess, and judgment when it comes to the protocol? Because this is really hard to teach people, especially sick people, and especially people who have just um, stepped off the Ferris wheel, so to speak, and, right. and come without a knowledge of their bodies and with it, without that innate intuition to listen to what it needs, because not everybody can hear that voice yet. So what are your thoughts about how people can, you know, use this handbook and apply the RCP to their own unique bodies right. and circumstances? Uh, great, great question. And I think it's a delicate balance, because especially, especially if you're coming out of being chronically out of balance and not, not feeling right, uh, you're, you're looking for a guide, and and we we're going to put a lot of stock in it. And I, and I think that's fine. Um, what I've learned over the years is that people who are chronically ill have learned not to trust their body. It's not working. They've been the system reinforces it. You're broken, you know, and so. You, you lose this, this real sense of trust that the body knows what it what it's, needs to do. And I think what the research has, has uh, really reinforced, but also the, uh, the work as, as a consultant, 
to, to teach people that they can trust their body, that the body is, is exquisitely designed to heal itself. It really is. The, the, the systems and the backup systems and the backup systems to the backup systems are elegant. And, but if you don't know any of that, then you, you just learn not to trust the body. The, the idea of, of the protocol is it is a guide. It, it's not a rigid, it's not, it's not meant to be rigid, but it's, it's probably important to be, it's certainly in the beginning, be more willing to do the complete protocol just so you can begin to get the full benefit of what it can do for you. And I think what you're, you're getting at is that over time, uh, I think what we really want is people to begin to trust themselves, trust their judgment, trust their intuition that I know what I need. There are certain times when I just, I've got to have certain type of food. I think we've all experienced that. Yeah. And, you know, I've, one of my favorite conversations with a client was she was coming downstairs uh, and came into the kitchen only to witness her 15 year old son eating a stick of butter like it was a carrot. And she says, it didn't occur to her that maybe he needs more butter, he needs more fat in his diet. Yeah. And so, again, he knew he needed more fat. She didn't know it. And so, um, I think it's important that we honor what, what is, is there some desire we have for, for the, of these nutrients? What, what are we drawn to? I'm, I'm invariably drawn to the minerals. I'm invariably drawn to uh, the retinol and the, and the, and the fat soluble side of the, of the house, just because I know how important that is for energy production and making sure that a copper gets into my body. Um, and I think it's, it's useful for people to experiment and be curious and, and not be concerned, but be, be more curious and begin to say, well, what if I did it this way? What if I, what if I didn't take that? And I took twice as much of this, what would happen? And I, I know there are people out there that do that. And I think it's great, you know? And I know there's as many people probably who follow it to the letter of the law, which yes. is fine, that's their prerogative. But, but I think that the whole goal is to help people uh, learn to feel confident in themselves and to gain that sense of, of um, stature that they, that they really trust that they know what they need and not to abandon the protocol, but maybe not be a slave to it as well. Yeah. And I think it, it, it takes time to develop that sense of self. I know sure. I certainly didn't have it when I began. And I remember Kristan commenting to me very early on about some aspect to just listen to my body on that one. And, and I thought, I, I don't know what my body's saying. I've got no idea. You know, right. and and now, um, five years later or whatever, it's it's a it's a completely different story. I can be really drawn, um, it, just innately. If I'm under a lot more stress, I am generally drawn to take more magnesium. It's not something I necessarily yeah. think. Oh, I'm under stress. I'm going to take more of this. It just it's happens just that way. Um, mm -hmm. So it it does take time and patience and stillness to listen just to to listen and and not be scared to experiment i think a lot of people have handed over their health power to a system and now coming into this model they still want to hand that power over maybe to an rcpc instead um so yeah it's working with those people isn't it to to just say just just listen have it, experiment have a go increase your adrenal cocktails see what happens you know you know, I've learned a very important lesson. I've learned many lessons from the clients I've worked with, but this one in particular. And the, the uh, client had very high blood pressure. And I said, and I grew up with a mom who had very high blood I mean, like, and um, I get, she had three heart attacks, but she had one stroke too. So, um, and so instinctively I said, oh, well, what medication do you take? And the client said, morally why would I take medication to try to stop my body from doing what it wants to do? I went, wow, thank you. That was quite a lesson. And so I'm not, I'm not advocating that we let blood pressure go amok or blood sugars go amok or whatever, but, but I thought it was a really powerful uh, comment to say, look, we've got we've to listen to our body and ask, what is it trying to tell me? What's, what's the reason for this? Yeah. And, and honor that as part of the uh, healing process. Absolutely, uh, put so well. It's every symptom, every pain um, has behind it a message of 
you know, it, it's a sign for us that there is something yeah. happening. Yeah. 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 Yeah, absolutely. So tell us a little bit more, Lee, I guess, about the other the other curiosity uh, people might have is how, how, did, how did you get from the point where you, uh, you know, you, you thought about developing a protocol, you kind of tick that box, it's, you know, it, it's always a work in progress, but there, there must have been some moment where you started to have the idea of formalising that into training for, for other people. Um, you know, what, what was your thought process there and, and how did that occur? Because I, I think that's a really big undertaking for anybody to think about taking that leap from actually, you know, um, putting themselves out there in the public eye to then going on to train. And, and we're not only talking about, you know, mums and dads, we're talking about now, you know, uh, health practitioners and doctors. So, you know, what was happening? What was going on there for you to, to take that big leap? That's what I, great, great question. I wish I had a really um, clear answer. Um, what was magical was, you know, announcing that we were going to have this class. And the very first group, um, group number one was just uh, populated by some phenomenal people. And um, I, I, think, I think what the original impetus was, tell us more, Cre create, a, create a forum where we can have a setting where we can learn more about what you've learned. Because yeah. so then it was um, social media. Uh, I'm not even sure that I had started the iron toxicity post when, this, when the training started. But um, and it wasn't as prolific on the, the podcasting um, in terms of just uh, sharing ideas. Mm -hmm. But I think it was a genuine desire by some of the uh, real hardcore magpies, as we call them, in the very beginning. Um, and again, that was a, a term of endearment because I was talking to a, a, a client in, in Australia and there was this bird just cackling in the background. I said, what is that? She said, that's magpie. I went, oh, okay. So that became the mag magnesium group, became the magpie group. Mag I remember hearing magnets as well, magpies and magnets. Magnets, right. Yeah. So the magnets were the people who were full of iron. Oh, okay. I never yeah. made that association. <laughs> magnets and magpies. Yeah. And so um, I think it really was born out of a, a desire um, of wanting to share what I knew, but also people really wanting to hear more. And I think it was very innocent at the beginning. It was just, let's just see what we can share. Mm -hmm. And it, it was uh, me just doing PowerPoint presentations live. And if, I think people were just like, just the, the amount of information that was coming back. And I think what we have now, what, what Christian and uh, Teresa and all these really talented people. I, I, I can't even begin to name them all, all the tutors. And it's, it's just been phenomenal, the work that's gone into creating a, an online course that it, it just has such sophistication to it now. It's a, it's a really a high caliber program that it, it's certainly gonna outlive me. <laughs> and and I, I really, I'm excited about that because it's just like, yeah. There's a lot of, of really good information in there. It's going to evolve. It's going to mature as well. We're going to add to it. But I, but I think it, um, it needed sophistication. And I think the people who have stepped up uh, to, to bring that, Tony Little, another great uh, champion, uh, to, to bring some real uh, rigor to it, um, people like C.J. Mort and others that, that have been in the uh, that your involvement has been very, very important as well throughout. And we're so grateful that you're doing these videos because it's just like, what a great way to record all this um, insight and these experiences. So it's just, I think the, the, the number of people who've stepped up to say, I wanna be a part of helping to codify this has been amazing. And I think the, the whole idea though is to create a forum where it's a, re a reproducible, predictable training that you know people are going to get a core um, set of information. Mm -hmm. And what, what we're constantly looking to do is uh, maybe create more of a green field that, that doesn't involve classroom 
that people can just say, I really want to just learn the basics. Yes. Give, me, give me some, just the basics. And so we're, we're looking at developing that. We've got the content. It's not that we don't have the content. It's just that we take pride in trying to make sure that people appreciate the information they're getting and they know how best to use it. Mm. It's especially in a, in a setting where they're going to be advising other people. Uh, it's one thing to, to know ideas. It's another thing to apply those ideas. And so I think we've, we've really put a lot of energy into the latter, making sure that's being applied yeah. properly. And then I think we can begin to back up and start uh, populating so that more people are aware of the basics. Yeah. That is really going to help society challenge this narrative. Because the narrative is, is not in our best interest. It never was, never has been. And it's time to begin to let um, the truth out. And so the, one of the cornerstones of, of the program is missing information equals missing truth. If you don't know, if you don't know that the heart cells can stop the absorption of copper, well, then you don't know the full story, do you? And that's a, that totally changes the paradigm. If, if you don't know that it turns out that people who are copper deficient, their, their iron doesn't get stored in ferritin, it gets stored in hemosiderin. I just learned that yesterday. That's like, oh, okay, that's, that's, a, that's a game changer. That, that ferritin is a very mysterious protein but if it isn't in the presence of copper, it morphs into hemosiderin, which is 10 times more problematic. Literally 10 times, because you can ten, store 10 times more yeah. iron. It's like the, um, the bank fault, don't you say? Exactly. And so it's like those nuggets of truth, if they're not understood, well, then you don't really know what you're doing when you're working with people to try to improve their health. And, and doctors, this is my favorite. Like clients who, who come back and they say, well, my doctor told me that I had to get my ferritin up to 100 in order for my thyroid medication to work. And I said, well, let's break that down. So what the doctor is asking you to do is create liver disease to get your thyroid medication to kick in. I said, does that make any sense at all? And it doesn't make any sense. This idea that, oh, it's a, it's a sign of uh, iron vitality. It's like, Oh my goodness, we're, we're we're really at rock bottom now. So I think it's it's that um, commitment to the truth that drives the program, so that people know that we don't make this stuff up. It's it's in the literature, folks. Mm. It's, it's it's steeped in the research, and it isn't just one article. Like the idea that all oh, this copper iron thing, they're not really joined at the hip of Zulupa. I could I could name a dozen articles where that's been the, the cornerstone of the scientists' research. It's 12 different groups. Mm. And it's like, when you get to that level of, of consistency, then you have to really begin to question the official narrative, which says that everyone's anemic and everyone's toxic. Yeah. It's like, come on, we're, we're big boys and girls. We can handle the truth. Yeah. And so I think that's what, what we want to do is really establish a solid foundation of truth to bring forward a completely different understanding of how the body works. Yeah, and I love the the, the concept or the next idea of going into that, um, you know, course that that people can access just for the basics. Because I think there's a real market out there for people who aren't ready to launch into the process of of taking the whole course with the live training. Um, but are ready for that information at the same time. So I look forward to, to seeing that. that. I think that'll be really valuable um, to a good portion of, of our community. So I guess we better wrap this up, Molly. I could sit here and, and, and chat to you all day long, but um, it's probably time, time for you to, to put your feet up. So final question for you, Molly. Sure. I need you to be succinct here. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I want yeah. you to sum up in, in just a sentence or two for me. How has the RCP changed your life? The RCP has allowed me to um, express my truest 
being. I, I mean, again, I am doing my life's work. And I think I've shared with people that when I was five years old, I know that knew I was here for reasons. I didn't know why. Yeah, it took me 55 years to figure it out. But but I really, this is why I'm here. The RCP is is why I'm here, and I'm honored and, and I'm just so humbled by this uh, experience. But it's allowed the, the I think the truest expression of who I am as a person and that I've always wanted to help people. I've always wanted to understand why, you know, get behind the, the what, what was going on. I've always wanted to understand. So what was really behind my, my dad's schizophrenic split? What, what was that about? What, what caused my mom to get COPD? And you know, why, why was cancer so prevalent in my family? And I, and I can answer all these questions and then many more, but, but I really, I think it's a natural, curiosity to understand why, because people who have some degree of intelligence, they want to be in control of their environment, right? And when distress begins for us, it begins when we don't have control. Mm -hmm. And so I think this has become a um, kind of a quest to, to get better understanding, better control, but it, but it isn't this quixotic control, it's to give people the, the empowerment that they can get control of themselves. Mm -hmm. They can get control of their situation. And that's a, that's a wonderful thing. So it's, it really is this fulfillment uh, of who I think I was meant to be. And I'm not done yet. I mean, I've got, I've got uh, more work to do, uh, but I feel, I feel really uh, um, happy to be a part of this movement and to be able to share as um, fully as I do. And it's, it's, it's such a peak experience, it's, it's hard to describe it. But that's really what it, what it means for me is that it's just this, uh, the, the music that's been inside that I wasn't aware of has now been able to be expressed. And, and, I'm, and I'm enjoying the, uh, the production. It's been a lot of, a lot of fun. Yeah, and what, a, what an example too, I think you've set just um, with the fact that you've done this so late in life not late in your life, but, you know, when, when no, they true. typically yeah. feel, that, you know, that, that, that they're, they're keying up for, for retirement, um, you've had this calling, obviously, for a really long time, hearing you, hearing you talk about, you know, your interest in, in your 30s in the natural world. So um, yeah. it's just, it's very, um, very motivating, I think, to, to, to know that, you know, you, these things can happen later in your life. And I think what you've done is you've, you know, you've turned this into kind of some sort of passion project and, and there's so many of us invested in it now um, and along for the ride. And, and it's just, a, it's a really exciting time and a really exciting thing to be part of. So we thank you for that opportunity. Um, you certainly came to my life in a, in a time of great distress with a very chronically ill child and, and failing health. So, you know, just from a personal aspect, uh, it completely changed the trajectory of my life um, uh, personally and, and professionally. So it's, um, it's pretty profound. So thank you so much, Molly, for just taking this time today to, you know, to um, for people to hear a different side that they probably haven't really heard yet. Um, and I've just, I've enjoyed hearing about what you eat and, and your, your own routine and, and um, what kind of led you to this point. I'm a, a, folks, I'm an average guy. I really am. I'm not, you know, I tease people. That now, now my new moniker is Magnesium Man. Now I'm going to be Cooper Man. Well, I'm not Superman. I'm just, I'm just having fun. And I'm trying to help folks. And I, I, I love these types of conversations because it just it allows me to share another side of, of this experience. But uh, at the end of the day, uh, I, I am a, I'm a pretty simple guy, but it, I'm very passionate about this. I think, Amy, you've picked up on the That's the fuel behind this. And I really delight in separating the fact from fiction. And, and I really, I think we've got a, a tremendous amount of momentum uh, that allowed us to have the luxury of helping to shape a lot of people's thinking and experiences. And that's, that's a great thing. And, and like I said, we're just getting started. We're just, we're five years in. Yeah. And in it's its it's be, but it's what it's going to be, you know, in multiples of, of five years from now, that's going to be a lot of fun. Yeah. Yeah. Well, 
Yeah. Well, thank you, kind sir. I've, um, I've loved chatting to you. Thank you. Likewise. A lot of fun. Yeah.